Uh, all right. Uh, third John. Uh, we're going to be tonight. The last uh, several weeks we've been reading through the letters of John, and the first one is a little bit longer than the other two. In the first, John's first letter, first John, we read about the assurance of our faith, doctrine, uh, love, obedience. And one of the things he warned in that first letter was he warned us all to try the spirits, to test the spirits, to see if they be true. He said there are many that have gone out from us because they are not of us. And uh, in Second John, his second letter, he kind of gives us what our attitude should be toward the false teachers. And we talked about that last week, about the doctrine of Jesus, the doctrine of Christ. How we said that when they come knocking on your door with a false doctrine or a false teaching, that we need to just send them away, don't invite them in, don't say God bless you. And the reason why he was saying that in the first century, toward the end of the first century when these letters were written, we had said that the church had become pretty much uh, it was starting to be institutionalized. It had spread throughout the Roman Empire. And they would meet in houses. They didn't have church buildings like we do. Uh, but they would e either meet in houses or in some instances rent. they would rent a space. Paul would rent places that they would meet. And... Uh, Many of the preachers, there would be pastors and so forth, but there were also itinerant preachers and prophets that would go from church to church, and they would, they would have credentials and, uh, you know, from places. They would, they would have uh, recommendations from different pastors and different churches and so forth. And, and there were those who were traveling from church to church who were bona fide Christian teachers and prophets and, and ministers, and then there were those who were false. So in Second John, he exhorts the lady who had a church in her house, not to give room or space to anybody that did not have the doctrine of Christ. In his third epistle, he tells us how we ought to act toward the ones that are from, from God. Uh, he begins, and we'll just start reading at verse 1. It says, The elder unto the well-beloved Gaius, whom I love in the truth. That word truth keeps appearing in John's letters. Now, verse 2, we're not going to spend a lot of time on, but it's important for us to understand this. He says, Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prospers. Now, this is a greeting. And, you know, when, when you write somebody a letter and you greet them, you say, I hope you're doing well. And it was a greeting. But there have been people that have managed to take this one verse and let it be a foundation for a whole uh, a group of doctrinal teachings that are aberrant in the Christian faith. Of course, I'm talking about the health and wealth gospel because they'll say, look, it says right there that he wishes that we ought to prosper and be in health. Well, you know, I hope we would prosper, and I hope that we would be healthy. I pray for that. We pray for healing and pray for God to bless and so forth. But they have managed to take this one verse of Scripture and, and, and turn it into a, in an, a movement, an aberrant movement, a movement that focuses on healing and prosperity that really goes way, way beyond the pale of the Scripture. You know, we believe God for healing. We believe God for prosperity, for stuff, what we need. But to make a doctrine of it. And they have found it to be a very lucrative doctrine. Uh, if, you're on, if you're on this side of the pulpit. And you know, how to, you know how to use that. You know how to jump on this one little verse. But see, proper Bible, what they would call hermeneutics, which is a big, long word, and I never really studied it. Okay, But the way we interpret Scripture and the way we understand Scripture, we have to put everything in context. We have to understand this is a greeting. It's not a doctrinal pronouncement. Okay, Enough about that. I just thought I would throw that in. Because many of the false teachers that are going around based what they're, do what they're doing on this one little verse, 
where Paul was just, or John was just saying, hey, I hope you're doing well. <laughs> okay, now, that's enough about that. Verse 3. The Apostle John writes to his friend Gaius, I rejoice greatly when the brethren came and testified of the truth that is in thee, even as thou walkest in the truth. There's that word, truth again, truth, truth. Man, it's so important that we live and walk in truth as believers. He says, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. I'm going to tell you something. Any pastor, any preacher, the greatest, if, if they're really called of God, the greatest joy they can have is knowing that something they said affected somebody's life in a positive way. That somebody learned something, somebody knows something they didn't know before. That somebody, somebody asked God to change their life according to some word that was spoken or preached. The Apostle John found great joy that this man named Gaius, Gaius, was probably one of his converts, was probably one of his disciples. And the church that was meeting in Gaius' house, or the church that he was a part of, they were walking in truth. He says, verse 5, He said, Beloved, thou dost faithfully whatsoever thou doest to the brethren and to strangers, which have been borne witness of the charity before the church, whom if you bring forward on their journey after a, goodly, a godly sort, thou shalt do well. Because that for his name's sake they went forth, taking nothing of the Gentiles. What he's saying here is, and what, what the, the true believers would do back then, as these traveling preachers would go from town to town and from house to house, folks like Gaius would receive them, give them a place to stay. Now remember, the false teachers, they were supposed to like not even let them in the door. But when a true minister of God, one that was truly called by God to be a preacher or a teacher, an apostle or a prophet, when they come by, he would open up his house to them and allow them to minister amongst the believers in that church, whether they met in his house or in one of the houses there. He, would, he was hospitable to the traveling, the itinerant preacher. <clears throat> he wasn't concerned about where they were coming from or where they were going, as long as they were walking in the truth. And we really see the same kind of thing today. You know, I've always had a heart to be that kind, to have that kind of a fellowship. Uh, as I said, this, this weekend, Brother Abram's passing through. We'll let him come in, share the word of God. We'll get, take an offering, give him a blessing, and say, God bless you. Go. I think he's going to Brazil or something next. He's, he travels all over the place. A few months ago, we had... Uh, Pastor Lazaro, who was here, remember the fellow from Cuba? He came here on, on good recommendation from a good friend. Uh, Dick Samuels called, and he came, and we blessed him. He, he blessed us with the word, and, and we blessed him with an offering, and sent him, said, God bless you, and sent him on his way. That happens in the body of Christ. That There are those who travel from church to church who are just as anointed as those who are pastoring, who are just as anointed as those who are anchored in one place. God has all different kinds of ministries, all different kinds of people that he uses in different capacities. And when one comes around who is from God, who is called of God, who is uh, uh, tested and proved and who you can be sure is really from God, then we need to receive him and bless him and send him on his way to the next place. That's what they would do in the first century. And this Gaius was very apt to do that. He said it's, it's more important for these itinerant preachers to be supported by the body than to try to get their support from the Gentiles, from out there. You see, we need to support those who are doing the work of the ministry, the traveling preacher. You know, we've, we've heard so much about, you know, the folks on TV and everything, and there's some bad ones, but there's some good ones. There's nothing wrong with supporting ministries if they're teaching and preaching the truth and doing what God wants them to do. Nothing wrong with that. Okay, prayerfully. Okay, now, he says, uh, Because that for thy name's sake, in verse 7, they went forth taking nothing of the Gentiles, we therefore ought to receive such that we might be fellow helpers 
to the truth. Now you remember when John said in his last letter, he said, if you, God, if you say God bless you to the false teachers, you're going to be partakers of what they're going to get, you're blessing false teaching. By the same token, if we bless the true men and women of God, we will receive their blessing. It's important for us to identify and recognize those preachers and teachers, whether they be a pastor or anchored, or whether they be traveling, the ones who are really doing God's work, speaking the truth according to God's word, and prayerfully support them. The body ought to support the body. Now, this is why sometimes when we have, you know, we, people have asked me, we don't take an offering like a lot of churches, you know, and, and there's nothing wrong with that. Most churches, they'll pass a basket, and we have a little box up here. I feel very strongly that if somebody comes in here and they're not, they might not be saved, or maybe they're just looking for a church, I don't, I don't feel that we should ask them for any money. I feel the folks that come here all the time, if you, if you come here, you're going to say, and you want to support, you're going to say, hey, where's, you know, what about the offering? We can say, well, there's a box up there. <laughs> but the ones who come in maybe don't know the Lord, or maybe aren't, you know, really aren't certain. I don't expect to get any support from out there. Okay? The body needs to support itself. I feel very strongly about that. That's why we never have spaghetti dinners. Right? We don't do that. Some do that, and if they want to do it, God bless them. I'm not, I'm not condemning or judging anybody. But the body ought to support the body. And that goes for not only the church, the congregation, but that goes for the ones who come through. All right, now, having said all that, we come to verse 9. And we read about a guy named Diotrephes. Okay, now, here's what he says. The Apostle John says, I wrote to the church, but Diotrephes who loved to have the preeminence among them, received us not. You mean back in the first century they had folks like that? You would have thought being so close to the ministry of Christ and being during the time of the actual apostles that everybody would be like really in tune. But even back then, they had folks they wasn't going to let anybody tell him what to do. Now, here's this guy named Diotrephes, whose name means, by the way, and for what it's worth, his name means Jupiter Supplies. <laughs> okay. He was named, uh, now don't feel bad, because later on we read about a good guy named Demetrius, and that name talks about another goddess or god. Okay, so <laughs> I'm not putting him down, but that's what it means, Jupiter Supplies. He was, that was his name. And it says here he loved to have the preeminence, and he refused direction from the Apostle John. Now, I want to tell you something. If the Apostle John wrote me a letter, I'd pay attention to it. Because he was one of the inner core with Jesus. I'll go a step further. If my state overseer writes me a letter, I'm going to pay attention to it. Because he got in that position, he didn't pay his way in. He's, he's human like anybody else. Understand this, God, when God established the church, the body of Christ, he established it as an ordered organization. Now, he didn't give us a flow chart of how things should go. Today we have different kinds of churches and different, different forms of church government. There's the Episcopal, and then there's the Independent, and there's that, all these ones. But basically, he, he didn't give us like, you know, this is the way it should be. But he did give us apostles, evangelists, uh, prophets, pastors, teachers. He gave deacons. He gave bishops, presbyters, overseers. There were these ones in the church that, that had a purpose, all answerable, to Christ, you know, the first, the first prerequisite of anybody, and if you could read through uh, 1 Timothy and Titus, and he gives, he gives the prerequisites for those in leadership positions in the church. 
A man that, he says, a man that desires the office of a bishop desires a good thing. And he goes on and talks about everything, every, every uh, standard that should be used to determine if a person should be an episcopos. That's what it means. Somebody who, who controls things under the direction of God. Order in the church is something that God has ordained. Godly, spirit-filled leadership. The Apostle John wrote a letter to the church there where Gaius was part, and his fellow named Diotrephes, who maybe was a pastor or maybe was a bishop, it doesn't really tell us what he was, but obviously he had some pull because he said, I don't want to hear nothing from that, from that John. He's not here. Hey, I'm in charge here. He loved to have, he wanted to be recognized, the preeminence. He wanted to be recognized as the guy in charge. Now you see, we need to have a balance here because as a pastor, you know, every once in a while you, 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 you guys will, will have like a pastor's appreciation thing for Rose and I. We, we greatly appreciate it. That's important to do. To show the people who are in leadership if you appreciate what they're doing and, and, and all that, that's important. But I, I have to quote my friend Harold Malee. He, says, he said, you know, when, when you guys do something like that for us, we, we, we really appreciate it, we love it. We chew it up, but we don't swallow Okay, you understand what I'm saying? We thank God for that. We thank God for the appreciation. But you got to be careful. Because some folks will let it go to the head. And I've seen it, and, and those of you who have been in churches long enough have seen it. Somebody gets in the position of pastor, and all of a sudden, they start talking different, acting different, looking different. Come on, you know what I'm talking Okay. Diotrephes obviously thought he was something. Because when people tried to come through, and, and, and again, we're kind of reading between the lines here, if John had written a letter of, of recommendation for a traveling preacher, this Diotrephes said, uh-uh, not in my church. He loved to have the preeminence. And he says, I don't want to hear from that, John. Look at verse 10. Here's what John says. Wherefore, if I come, I will remember his deeds which he does, prating against us with malicious words, and not content therewith, neither does he himself receive the brethren, and forbids them that would, and cast them out of the church. Now listen to this setup. The Diotrephes was in. He had so much control and how he got it, we don't, know the, we don't know the details of this. But he had got to the place where he had so much control that he could actually throw people out of the church if they disagreed with him. Just imagine that. Now, again, we need to have a scriptural understanding of things. If you read through the New Testament, the epistles of Paul, there were times when Paul said, put them out. Okay? Why would he do that? Well, one reason would be unrepentant sin. We all know the story from 1 Corinthians. There was a man who was, who was uh, cohabiting with his, with his stepmother. And Paul said, even the Gentiles don't do that kind of stuff. They said, deliver him over to Satan to see if he's really saved. And we know the guy repented and he came back and they received him back. But when somebody is practicing such blatant, especially people who are maybe in the forefront or maybe people who have some kind of office, they're practicing unrepentant, blatant sin, disregarding everything the church has to say. There can be a time when you can say, excuse me, but you're not welcome here. We're praying for you, but you need to leave. Always for the purpose of restoration. Never for the purpose of punishment or getting evil or vengeance. Always for the purpose, you know, when, when Paul said, deliver him over to Satan, it was like, okay, Let's see how saved he really is. And the guy ended up being really saved and he came back. Okay. Now, another reason. He talks in different places about uh, people that cause discord and so forth. There, there are reasons for church discipline. And it always has to be scriptural and always has to be with a, with a purpose of restoration. 
But what happens in what, what people call toxic churches, when one person or a group of people, but particularly one person, gets all the power that I could say, you disagree with me, hit the road. That's where they were in the first century. Under the leadership of the Apostle John. We're not talking about organizations and denominations. This is, this is way back then. He says, I remember his deeds in verse 10. He was prating against us with malicious words. This Diotrephes was bad-mouthing the Apostle John. I wouldn't want to badmouth him. I don't like to badmouth anybody, but especially the Apostle John. It says, And not content therewith, neither does he himself receive the brethren. He refused to let anybody else come in and preach. He refused the traveling prophets, the traveling preachers. He had the disease... He, be, he became infected with clergy. Okay, clergy. Ooh, clergy. Okay. Now, clergy is a word that's used to describe people. I, they, they, they say uh, they have the term people of the cloth. I don't know where they ever got that term. <laughs> clergy are profes- religious professionals. I guess I'm a clergy. I'm a clergy. Because we're religious profession. But what happens, and, and this happened, it's, it was happening here, and happened throughout the centuries, where clergy began to be exalted. Well, actually, they exalted themselves, but, and people went along with the program. Clergy began to be exalted. So anybody that was a religious professional in the church, pastors, Teachers, apostles, evangelists, prophets, uh, elders, presbyters, bishops. They began to be like higher up than the rest of the people. Okay. Look, look at a couple passages with me. Turn over just a few pages over to the Revelation. And look at, look at chapter 2, the letters to the churches. And look at verse uh, 2. Well, let's, let's look, at verse, look at verse 2, uh, just to read down, because I hate to take things out. Verse, verse 2, Jesus is writing a letter to the church at Ephesus. He said this, I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience and how you cannot bear them which are evil, and thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and hast found them liars. And has borne and has patience, and for my name's sake has labored and has not fainted. Nevertheless, I have someone against you. The church at Ephesus was great at, at discerning truth from error. Nevertheless, I have someone against you because you have left your first love. They didn't lose their first love. They left their first love. It's another message. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and remove thy candlestick out of its place, except thou repent. Now, verse 6. This is what I want to get to. But this thou hast. Church of Ephesus, you got this going for you. You hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Now, the Nicolaitans, I said this, if you ever heard any of the messages from Revelation, when we did a series on Revelation, the Nicolaitans were a group of people, and there's some, some disagreement on what they really were about, but most, most of the historians and the commentaries believe that, that uh, the fellow named Nicholas, which is his name after, was somebody who began to exalt the clergy. They began to put the, the clerical people, the, the, the ministers, uh, the ministry gifts, the, the pastors, teachers, evangelists, apostles, and so forth, began to, to uh, put them on a higher frame. This is in the first century now. It began that far back. They found way, way back that, that folks in position of religious leadership can have a lot of power, can wield a lot of power if they know how to do it. And they began to exalt clergy. And, of course, we know after a few hundred years, you know, came the, the big hats and the robes and the, okay. And, and, you know, the bishops, you know, the Bishop of Rome became the Pope. 
And, you know, even today they bow down and kiss his ring. Okay. Now, now, we talk about that in the Catholic Church, but you know what? It goes on everywhere. Maybe not to that level. Maybe not to that degree. But there are people who will exalt their preacher, their pastor, not just appreciate him, not just you know, honor him, because the Bible says to honor those that teach, you know, share with them, that, to share the word with you, that's important. You know, that's, that's good to do that. But there are those who have gone a step further, and they put their pastor, preacher, like, oh... And it happens. It happens with the, with, the, with the Christian celebrity preachers. People are like, oh, you know. Look, look at one more scripture. Just, just, just look. It's in chapter 2 of Revelation. And drop down to... Uh, <laughs> he's writing to the church of Pergamos. Look at uh, verse 13. I know your works and where you dwell, even where Satan's seat is, and you hold fast my name. And have not denied my faith, even in those days wherein Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you, wherein Satan dwells. Verse 14. But I have a few things against you, church of Pergamos. Because you have them that hold to the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel. That's another message, too. To eat things sacrificed unto idols and to commit fornication. Verse 15, so hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. While the Ephesians hated them, the folks in Pergamos, they thought that was all right. So while in one city, they were going against this, this you know, uh, clerisy, somebody called it. It's the heresy, clerisy. Pergamos, they were eating it up. They're taking their leaders and they were, ooh. In either case, God says he hates it. He hates it when people are exalted just because of the position or the calling that's on their life. And it's really sad when folks start believing their own press clippings. See, there's, there's people that have learned to eat that up. That, you know, being built, because we all, we all like to get a pat on the back. Hey, let's face it. We all like to have somebody come up to us and say, hey, hey you did a good job. You know, we all like that. And that's, that's good. That's all right to encourage people. But when it gets to the point, when we start thinking, man, I'm really getting good at this. Man, I'm really, man, I'm really, oh, I'm ready for the next level now. But, oh, Lord, take me to the next level. Oh. And we start thinking, you know, when I say we, I mean the clergy. The ones with a card in their wallet. I got a little card in my wallet that says, Reverend. When, when, when the people with the cards, you know, when Jesus, I, I put a little thing on YouTube. I don't know if anybody's seen it or not. But recently, you know, there was, there was a very prominent uh, TV preacher that got pulled over for drunk driving. Okay. Maybe you probably all heard of it. I'm saying, listen, pray for healing, restoration. That's wonderful. But if you're going to have a card in your wallet that says reverend on it, you ought to be able to keep your mouth off a bottle. That's quiet. If you have a card in your wallet that says Reverend on it, you ought to be able to keep, keep from smoking a crack pipe. You ought to be able to be faithful to your spouse if you have a card that says Reverend on it. If you can't do that, take the card, rip it up, go get a job. We'll pray for you. Be saved. That's right. You know, every, we're all human. We all have faults. Yeah, yeah, I, I know that. But if you're going to walk, if you're going to stand behind a pulpit and have, have a card in your wallet that says reverend or bishop or pastor or whatever, you, you better be able to keep yourself from doing that kind of stuff. Whether or not you get caught. <laughs> okay. I'm, I guess I'm getting off. I guess I'm getting off the boat here. But, but listen. All right. Let's go back. Let's go back to 3 John. And we'll, we'll finish up. I don't want to get too far off the track. <laughs> he says, let's read verse 10 again. There's only one chapter, so I don't have to tell you what chapter. Wherefore, if I come, I will remember his deeds, which he does, praying against us with malicious words and not content therewith. Neither does he himself receive the brethren and forbids them that would and cast them out of the church, throws them out if they don't agree with him. My way or the highway. <laughs> I 
Yeah, I, I shouldn't say. I knew, I knew a guy one time. He took a church. He went in there. He says, it's my way or the highway. And it was the highway. <laughs> okay. All right. That's, all right. <laughs> Verse 11. Beloved, the Apostle John writes, follow not that which is evil, but that which is good. See, we need, we need to look at the people that we respect as leaders in the church, and particularly clergy. And I'm talking about those in charge spiritually. We need to take a good look at the people who are running the place and see how they live. And I put myself there. And you know what? If you, if you, look, at me, if you look at me with a magnifying glass, you're going to find, you're going to find some faults. I'm not saying that people going to stand up here are going to be absolutely perfect and spotless and, you know. But we at least ought to be trying to live what we're preaching. He said, follow not that which is evil, but that which is good. He that does good is of God, but he that does evil has not seen God. You know, John has a way of putting things about as simple as you can get them. Good, God, evil, not God. Okay, this Diotrephes that he's talking about, he was evil. His concern wasn't the well-being of the people who were placed under his leadership. His concern was his own popularity. His concern was his title. His concern was what everybody thought about him. The, 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 the church that he was over, whether he was a pastor or whatever his, his office was, that was, that was just his vehicle for acceptance, he saw, his, he saw that body as being his. And when people looked at him, they wouldn't see how good he was doing in the church. It's good or evil. Okay? Now listen. Look at verse 12. He changes his topic just a little bit. <laughs> I'm not going to keep you much longer at all. He says, Demetrius, now here's another guy. Demetrius has a good report of all men and of the truth itself. Now, John is giving a recommendation to this other named Demetrius. It could very well be that this Diotrephes, when, when he heard about Demetrius, he said, he's not, he's not speaking here. I don't care who recommends. But John says, Demetrius has a good report of all men and of the truth itself. And we also bear record, and you know that our record is true. He begins his letter by talking about truth. He ends his letter about talking, by talking about truth. This gospel thing, this church thing, it's all about truth. It's not about popularity. It's not a popularity contest. It's not about you know, what people think of me or think people think of leadership. It's not about that. It's about the truth of the gospel. And if they come... Preaching another gospel, we need to say, go. Don't let them in. Don't say, God bless you. If they come preaching the gospel, we need to say, come. Here, preach. Take an offering. We'll send you off with God's blessing to the next place. That's the way the body's supposed to work. Encouraging one another. Supporting one another in the truth. In the truth. That's the bottom line. Of all three of his letters, that's been the bottom line, the truth. He began his first letter by saying, listen, what we've told unto you, we've seen with our own eyes. It's the truth. Jesus Christ is the the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody gets to the Father but through him. That's the truth. And when they come speaking something else, and when they come promoting themselves, come on, we've... There's examples. If, if it was going on back then, you know, back then they would travel from city to city. They didn't have jets. They didn't have buses. They either had to walk or ride a donkey or, you know, they didn't have, like, mass transit. They had to walk. If that was going on back then, how about now? They didn't have outlets where they could be watched by 20 million people. Now, I want to tell you something. Let a preacher get on to 
we need to pray for the good ones that are on there. There's some good preachers on TV. We need to pray for them. And the ones, listen, I, I believe that a lot of the ones who have like gone astray, they might, have, they might not have started that way. I've known preachers who have started out humble, preaching God's word. They start getting an audience. And they start getting the pats on the back. And the offerings come in. They start getting. We need to pray for them. I want to tell you something else. You need to pray for pastors. I appreciate you all praise. I know you all pray for me and I thank you. But for pastors in, in, in churches, even small churches, it can happen there too. It doesn't have to be 20 million people. It can be 20. Where a fellow gets puffed up or a woman gets puffed up. Pray for those that minister in song, minister in music, because people can get puffed up. They can get blown out of proportion. And thinking, man, I'm something. I'm really, I'm really something now. I've arrived. It's almost like, I, I don't know. It's almost like sometimes these folks have like American Idol for preachers. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You know, we say, we, the Apostle Paul dealt with that in 1 Corinthians. He said in that letter, he said, you know, some of you say I'm of Paul and some of you say I'm of Apollos and some of you say I'm a Peter man. And I, some, I'm, some of you, you know, they all had their favorite preachers, Christian celebrity. And Paul said, listen, you, you, you're missing the boat. One plants, one waters, but it's God that gives the increase. It's the Holy Spirit that takes the word preached and plants it in our hearts and helps it grow. It's not one man. I thank God for good, godly men and women, preachers and teachers in the word and locally and on TV. I thank God for them. But they're not the ones that do it. I can't save anybody. I can't make anybody learn anything. I can only give what God gives me to give. It takes the Holy Spirit to take that thing and plant that seed in your heart and let it start to grow. It's God that brings the increase. It's God who should get the glory. If we sing, if we preach, if we pray, if we go out and minister, it's God who gets the glory. Somebody gets saved, it's God who gets the glory. Somebody's life gets touched and changed, it's God who gets the glory. Whether it's this church or the church up the hill or the church over there or wherever it might be. You might hear the word in one place and get saved in another. But it doesn't matter. It's one body. And we're all supposed to be working for the same thing. Yeah, I'm working for the same guy, Jesus. He's ultimately my head. Yeah, I got the overseer in Carlisle, the one in Cleveland, Tennessee. But ultimately, Jesus is the one I'm working for. That's the bottom line. That's what John's trying to say to gays. He says, man, this, these people come up and try to tell you you can't do this. Listen. You listen to the Lord. You look, for, you look for godly leaders. You pray for God to send godly people to be in control in, in that hierarchy in the church. The apostolic, the pastors, the evangelists, the teachers. Pray for God-anointed, God-called people. And watch what they do. And if they're doing good, you follow them. And if they're doing evil, Say no thanks. Amen.